How are you feeling? Very good. Actually, this is going to be the finale. It's the best concert. Down? Yeah. yeah, down, down, yeah.
Nicholas Payton, trumpeter, Michael Brecker, sax player. Who's Clarence Greatmore Brown? Joshua Redmond, uh, uh, tenor sax. Diana Reeves, I think singer. Stephen Harris, Cyrus Chestnut, he. Cyrus is the bassist or drummer? Yeah. Pianist. Okay, Regina Carter. Violin. Violin. Cecilia Smith, Mary Carter, Ingrid Jensen. Ingrid Jensen is a lovely trumpet player. Canadian, na? Yeah. So how, why did you introduce your son to jazz? Why didn't you introduce him to good Carnatic music? You see, I have had no, no um, influence, South Indian influence, having been in Calcutta. I was always running away from my home. And uh, we heard very fine uh, music, a lot of it is March music, Sousa, a lot of the things like Persian market, but we also heard a uh, lot of big band sound, uh, the sounds of Glenn Miller. So all those had their influence, plus the American song book where we, we danced with the girls uh, from girls' school. I better wear my shirt. <laughs> Thank you.
curious about this team, going to John Paul Clay. And Miles Davis, which is coming from Charlie Parker, close to Bud Powell, you got a team going to Miles Davis, and from Miles you go to John Paul Clay. Then from here, from uh, Bud, you can go to the other pianists like Phineas Newborn Jr., Milton Kelly, Cedar Walton, and uh, then it's Sunny Clark. There's also Horace Silver out there. There's George Shill, let's not forget. You know. There's Lenny Justana, so William, and Villain, of course. It's a new tango which I've written, relatively new, it's a couple of months old, and it's called Tango Sentimental. very fond of the veena and the flute. I did want to pick up the veena, but then the first master who came and you know, interviewed me, he said, you are first to sing, and then only I will teach you. So I said, no, I'm not singing. If that is a condition, I'm not going to. Mothers uh, sing, sing their babies to sleep. So I used to play records for them. And one particular record that it was a uh, Bach's uh, Brandenburg Concerto. He was very fond of. And always he used to ask for the, the water, the water flowing uh, music. In Tamil, he used to say Tani Kotra Lala. Lala was music and Tani is water, Kotra is water.
And I found that his bliss was in when he was playing. So as long as he was playing, he was happy. So every mother wants his child to be happy. Were there people around you who said, how, how can you support this or did you have to listen no, to criticism? Yes, people definitely told me that uh, you were the one who made some, put some sense into you. So I said, I'm trying to put some sense into you.
I would say the two places in terms of jazz audience appreciation, appreciation of jazz music from an audience. One is Bombay, Mumbai, the other is Kolkata. Pretty much the most talented bunch of musicians are from here. Just because there's a sustained exposure, they get access to good musicianship, you know. For example, I, who I consider the best guitar player in India lives in Calcutta. He's originally from Palghat. His name is Sumit Ramachandran. Now, nobody has his level of musicianship among these musicians playing rock music and uh, or even jazz music a lot of you know very few musicians have that kind of uh, talent and he's here he's here because he at least has some opportunity to earn a living playing live music whereas in other cities like Bombay he'll end up in the advertising industry and the more you're in any kind of industry where you're forced to compose but it's all cut and paste uh, cut and paste jobs on a computer and you're not forced to react to live music situations, you know, you lose the ability to play live. And so a lot of musicians who ended up in the film industry, who, in, who ended up, you know, doing jingles, have lost the technique, they've lost the ability to play, they've lost their chops. So what was it special about Calcutta that cultivated that? that See, you need an operating culture. It's like going to Spain. Like, for example, you want to learn Spanish, you have to go to Spain. You have to be around people who do it all the time. And they're doing it with the right accent, with the right flavoring. And it's not just about memorizing words and vocabulary, but it's about, you know, feeling the flow of the language and being in the moment in the language. I mean, yes, there is the, the difference between New York and, say, Paris is Paris might have 29 jazz clubs. And New York may have... I don't know, maybe, you know, four times the number of places where jazz is played. But the players, just the, the number of players in New York and the quality of musicianship in New York is a whole level more than Paris. It's just because of a sustained exposure. That's the place where the language is getting refined and refined by many people. You need many people on a scene to refine a language. And similarly with musical languages, you need many people. You just can't have a scene with two people. It's not possible. It's not possible at all. Chirag, madam, please, please to meet you. Madhav, Chari. Yeah. Sure. yeah. So you became best actor in class nine. In class nine. Nine got the best actor. Now you're in which class? class you're, you're in class twelve. Oh, next year is the horrible board exam. Yes. Okay. Prefect. Oh, I see the double, yes. the double. You're studying for the SATs. Yeah. You know that exam well. But the music room, where I used to hang out, my teacher was Tony Menezes, right. who passed away in the um, early eighties. The library is here still to the right, right? Okay, now let's... Yeah, I bought my first Tintin comic in the library. Can I just go and see the music room for a second? Is this straight? Yeah, you all were down there in the town chapel. Yeah. In downstairs? downstairs, after that in the music room. But right hand there's a classroom. Yeah. Left. Yeah. That is the music room. There? Okay. Convoluted methodologies. I noticed these desks haven't been changed since the time I've been in school. There's nothing there. I can't open it though. No, it's jammed.
girl should, should be bamboo daku without wearing topi she is driving The Max Miller piano has been degraded. Um, the Calcutta School of Pian Music piano has been, uh, somebody has done a hatchet job on it and there's nothing else there and the tuning is just pathetic. It's absolutely pathetic. The keys are in bad shape and the Braganza piano hardly holds tuning. I played this on August 5th in a trio performance at some place else at the Park Hotel and the piano was losing tuning. So I'm, I'm playing an E in my right hand and I'm trying to play an E in my left hand and the E is somehow moving down into the E flat range. It's a bit problematic. And uh, the norm was when I had to play on bad pianos in India, one would just, you know, grit one's teeth and just kind of grin and bear it and just improvise on the spot. But now I've got a little bit tired of that. I mean, you know, uh, one is that I have uh, what people consider perfect pitch or absolute pitch. So it's a problem when, you know, the piano start losing the tuning. I tend to get very irritated um, when that happens. And I don't like pianos which are not holding tuning. Um, and it's one thing where it's, you know, it's, if it's uniformly out of tune, then one can kind of compensate. But it's not uniformly out of tune. Some stuff goes a little bit more out of tune. So then it's, it's, just, it's just horrible. And uh, so thankfully, I played a digital yesterday, and the digital cannot go out of tune. But it's still a digital piano. It is not uh, an actual acoustic where you feel the, when you press the key, the hammer hits a string, and the string moves air. Now, that's breath and you will not get breath out of an electric instrument, like an electric piano. Um, Keith Jarrett talks about it a lot. I mean, you know, it is about breath. So I'm saddened that one major city out of the five cities, and it's probably one of the few, I think Delhi doesn't have too many good pianos either. So, you know, between Calcutta and Delhi, you've got two major cities which have, you know, some, you know, horrible, horrible, horrible pianos. The, all the stuff on the left, you know, hasn't gone, it's dead. I mean, it's historic. Now this Alishan Golden Restaurant, now that... Sida, Sida. Ah, oh, bloody hell. Block everyone. Ah, here is gate, hai. right side, by St. James School. Can you come to 15 minutes? I'm old boy here, graduated in 1985. Yes. My name is on the board. <laughs> huh? You can send it to the school. I can send it to the school. Yeah. What is the school one? 165 ABC. One, and Kolkata? 40. 14. 14. Yeah, one four, that's right. You're losing weight while you're playing too much these days. <laughs> too much playing, which is good. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, I guess they're removed. We used to have all these plaques up there with people who had won prizes and so on and so forth. My name was there in a couple. It's not here. Okay, fine. It's kind of a dim, dingy place, but you know, he changed it around a little bit. This piano wasn't there when I was in the school, but surprisingly it seems to hold tuning. In the English Bengali, do you listen to any music from, uh, from the West, like English music, anything you listen to? Yes. Nothing, but you like Hindi music? Yes. What do you like? What's your favorite song? Um, 
दस डू नो एनी नेम्स ऑफ हिंदी म्यूजिक कंपोजर्स नो यू डोंट नो ओके here is used to be the house of a gentleman by the name of mr menezes who used to be the mathematics teacher in the school but he had one of the best collections of art blakey so it's it was here that i heard art blakey and the jazz messengers for the first time when i was in the 11th grade and that was very 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 powerful hearing that hearing art blakey and the jazz messengers with bobby timmons on piano playing monin that was incredible it was just fun to just come here and just put on a record and listen to music for one hour i mean that was great and that was a great way to spend the you know just just an afternoon from 12 o'clock to whenever the school gave out and then you went home um great way to cut classes i i can tell you it's one of the most creative ways to cut classes rather than you know playing video games or whatever the piano was exactly here um i would sit on it here that will be facing this way mr nandan bagchi would have the drums here there'll be a carpet here he'll put the drums here and lu hill would be here i would want to start at 2 but mr bagchi would want to have tea so we'll have to take a break a tea break from 2 to 2:15 before the gig before all the traumatic stuff i would throw at them you know be new stuff and we would rehearse and we'd have a tea break in the middle but we would do actually very meticulous directed stuff and you know they would learn it and we would do it monday tuesday wednesday thursday friday and then on saturday morning from 10 a.m. till 1 p.m. so 6 days 3 hour rehearsal 6 3 is 18 18 hours of rehearsal for, for for every week without taking a break so i'll be back at the piano at home and you know work out some material and then get ready for the next day and then get ready the next day and then friday would come we look forward for saturday morning practice now who's going to practice who's crazy enough to practice on a saturday morning from 10 in the morning till 12 or maybe even 1 you know madhav chari nandan bachu and lu hilt see
It's okay. One second. I have to move this in. It would be nice if he finishes with a shot of you walking out through that door. Mm. Looking back at the piano. What about memories? Yes, quite some. Quite some. Rehearsal time, 1991. Three months. Now I need to practice like that now. 1984. It was incredible musicianship. It was Woody Shaw on trumpet, Steve Today on. Uh, Conch shells and trombones, basic, mainly trombone. Uh, Ronnie Barrage on drums, Stafford James on bass, and Mr. Kirk Lightsey on piano. And I can remember the tunes they played. They played um, a composition by Woody called Woody One on the New Ark. Um, and I think uh, I can also remember they played a very beautiful ballad by Horace Silver called Peace. I can remember all these things. The very next year, I saw Kirk Lightsey. I just saw two monster piano players. You know, um, Kenny Barron at that time was also started to work with Stan Getz, you know, um, who's a great musician. And Kirk Lightsey had worked extensively with Dexter Gordon, one of my all-time favorite tenor saxophone players. So those were the energies I was exposed to. So you can't imagine how heavy it was, just being here. Never seen it. So I was like a little kid in a candy store. Couldn't help it. it you know, it was too much fun. I'd much rather just hang out with the jazz musicians and listen to jazz music than doing any kind of academic study. I mean, that's just not me, you know. Chinese balls. It's almost like, see, you take this, just drop your shoulders, and you're very relaxed in doing it, but doing it very slowly. You understand? Like here, it is tension. Okay, yeah, because, yeah. I mentioned the name of a great jazz pianist, the name of Phineas Newborn Jr. Hmm. Phineas Newborn Jr. was a musician on the same league as Bud, almost moving into the Bud Powell hmm. league, hmm. and he is like the guy who is, you know, toe to toe with Oscar Peterson as a pianist. Brilliant virtuoso musician of the hard bop, you know, can very, you know, bebop, hard bop music. And uh, brilliant, 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 brilliant. I mean, you know, um, very beautiful energy. I mentioned this to one of our great film composers who belongs to a triumvirate, which is well known. And you know what he tells me? He tells me, triumvirate means three. I'm not mentioning the names, but you know, he tells me, oh, Phineas Newborn, oh, he's an old-fashioned piano player. That's the problem. He's not an old-fashioned piano player. Are you going to call Beethoven old-fashioned? Are you going to call Bach old-fashioned? Are you going to call Tyagaraja old-fashioned? You can dismiss Phineas, but can you go out there and play for five minutes what Phineas played? You know, can you go out there and, you know, and Phineas is recorded with Paul Chambers and Roy Haynes. There's Keith Jarrett, there's Herbie Hancock, there's Chick Corea. And there's Kenny Barron. And I would say these are the four greatest living jazz pianists today. Each one of them, beautiful. And this is Kenny Barron telling me about Phineas Newborn. So how can we listen to some guy who belongs to a triumvirate in Bombay? But this is the problem with India, because if that person had humbled himself and just said, look, this is amazing music, he might have grown. No. What is a Tam Bram doing in Calcutta playing jazz music? Very good question. Um, 
this was probably in 77, um, you know, could be, I think around the 76, 77. This was a public concert at our own house for a, over 100 people, maybe 100, 100 people at least, where Louis Banks played a full two and a half hour piano recital. And this was serious music. I mean, he was going to be playing, you know, repertoire coming from Herbie Hancock and all of that. It's not watered down music. So I had all of this stuff around me, so, and I was already hooked into the music. There's a tremendous amount of intellectual curiosity here, and that actually formed me as a musician. It allowed me to go into realms of jazz music, which is not normally explored by many mainstream jazz musicians um, in the United States. It allowed me to go deep into finding out the African mythological roots of jazz music. It allowed me to go into Cuban music. It just this whole curiosity, what, is, what are other music forms? They must be just as exciting, you know, this whole openness, so, and that is Kolkata. That is my parents also. Now let's not forget that. Perhaps even more important. But then they were able to, you know, impart the knowledge system within the cultural milieu of Calcutta, where I was living. After a whole bunch of musicians left in the late 70s, there's no town which has ever had a jazz scene quite like Kolkata. And so that, I guess, is the answer to what a tambram is doing playing jazz. In 1958 in Harlem, the musicians are in this group, both uh, mostly men, but there, there are quite a number of ladies here. Um, they represent the cream of jazz creation at that point. The Benny Goldson, for instance, then you have Art Farmer, then you have Gigi Grice, Hank Jones, Horst Silver, you have uh, Buck Layton, Coleman Hawkins is the other also. There are quite a number of whites also here who rub shoulders with, um, with uh, the Afro-Americans and uh, they, all, they also um, went to all these nightclubs and, and listened to jazz, which they thoroughly enjoyed. Madhav? But do you think someone like Madhav has a future in this country? I don't know about this country because uh, people want noise. I went to Bang & Olsen the other day. They're, they're novelist people. They want to buy this so that they can show everybody, see how big our sound is produced. And at the same time, they don't, do not know, I think, that they're damaging their ears severely. You know, I, I don't buy this whole rubbish that, oh, you know, I, we are playing in front of an audience, so we have to be eternally grateful to the audience for showing up. Also, thank you, thank you, sirs, for showing up. No. You know what we're doing? We're doing spiritual healing out there on the stage for the audience. We're giving them right energy. We're healing them. So you know what? In some sense, you know, we're doctors. Let them be very thankful to it. They might have paid a ticket to see us. That's beside the point. Two albums which are actually extremely serious, serious jazz albums. They're not at all watered down. One is Miles Davis's Kind of Blue. And the other one is John Coltrane's A Love Supreme. And they've sold millions and millions of albums worldwide. And it's not easy, I mean, John Coltrane's A Love Supreme is not necessarily easy listening, but people bought the album. There was something very deep which was communicated. Just because, you know, one has a good CD collection, one automatically becomes a very learned listener of the music. It doesn't happen that way. Just because one has, you know, tasted different foods from different restaurants, it doesn't mean that you're going to become a very good cook. But what I still see, which has not happened, is that there's not enough synergy. I mean, even within cities, there are scenes and people don't talk to each other. So when I was growing up, 
I didn't talk to people who were in the Hindustani music world. But I should have. On some level, you know, it's a old music form. It's a music form which inspired John Coltrane. I really felt very isolated in school for, for whatever reason. So I think music was really an outlet. It was really the interior world. It was music and books. You know, writing a 30 second piece is not difficult at all. No matter what anything anybody says, it's really not difficult. And it's not even a 30 second piece, it's just a bunch of sound which goes with the visual. So there's some kind of convergence which enhances the visual. But when you keep doing that day in and day out, and you are doing it um, and sacrificing your live performance, and you're sacrificing your day-to-day -day practice because you could be practicing, then over a period of time, over 10-15 years, your musical abilities will deteriorate. And that is true, it has deteriorated every one of the musicians who have become part of this whole jingle scene all sorts of talented people in music have gone into other things like you know DJing you know that's all that's a bunch of crap actually DJing to me you know there is nothing I find nothing glorified about you know playing a tape recorder I mean please that's not musicianship let's not get carried away but you know all sorts of things seem to be wrong you know the focus has gone the technical ability has gone even the ability to hear has gone the aesthetic ability has gone now I can't understand that really you know, I really can't understand that okay I guess I could you know, um, in the sense that you don't, you, you're just not engaging music anymore at a creative level. So what happens is for 15 years, if you are doing non-creative musicianship, it is not just that, oh, you know, I'm doing music for 15 years, I'm at least in the musical world because I'm doing jingles or whatever. But you're doing non-creative musicianship, so your musical consciousness will reduce. It's actually better not to do music at all. In fact, I feel rather than do degrading music or rather than do music where you consider it to be like really a chore and a job, Okay, I understand we all have to pay rent. I understand we have to put food on the table. I understand we have to...